All right, we started chapter 20 yesterday about hypothesis tests. And I said there was going to be four steps. We kind of got through the first two steps yesterday. So today I'm going to explain the other two steps. And then I'm going to do a hypothesis test all the way through, step by step. And you'll see that it is kind of a long process, but that, again, most of the hypothesis tests are going to have the same format, right? And we'll just talk about this for a few. There's nothing else really in this chapter besides how to complete a hypothesis test. So, through the practice some in class today, we'll practice some again tomorrow, um, but we're going to make sure we get really good at these hypothesis tests. All right, so yesterday, we talked about this airplane example, um, we, this ingot, metal pieces for airplanes, and the management thought that it was 20% cracking rate, and the sample of this new system was 17% cracking rate, so we wanted to see if it was decreased. Four steps, and the first step was the hypotheses, right? We have the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The null is that there is no change, the alternative is that there is some change. Um, we talked about how your alternative hypothesis could have three different symbols, not equal to, as in there is some change of some sort, or greater than or less than, increasing or decreasing. Um, some, we did some hypothesis. And then we talked about you have to use a model to do the hypothesis test, and that model is that sampling distribution model for proportions we talked about in chapter 18, and that you check the conditions, and then we had to make a statement about how the, 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 the use the sampling distribution for proportions with a normal model form a one proportion z test. So if I give you a problem right now, I would expect to be able to write hypotheses that they were meant. Three or two more steps. So the next step is the mechanic. And the mechanic is going to be the work. All right? Yes, it is a way to do this in your calculator. And no, I'm not going to show it to you for a while. Okay? Because you have to, on the calculator, and you have no work of any kind, quiz in class, anything. So for one proportion of these, Mechanics goes as go as follows. Okay, using a normal model, you can find a z-score. If you don't z-scores, it was some statistic minus a well. So we have a stat. we have a parameter, our hypothesis. Right to find. So we have in chapter 18 and 19, same formula, right? In this case, we're using for pretending that there has been a change. Key hat is to have evidence that there's been a change, and we'll see that. So right there for the hypothesis. When we get to this P hat minus not situation. On your AP statistical sheet, it says standardized test statistics. And that, in this case, that means Z. And some other places, it doesn't mean Z, it means something else. We'll get there. But it gives it to you. So you do not have this formula. That is not there for you. What you do have, standardized test statistics, is equal to the statistics minus the parameter divided by the standard deviation of the statistic. Well, we're talking about proportions. A stat is what you have sampled. Right? A statistic is something you've sampled. So in this case, p hat. A parameter is something for the population. So in this case, that's p. Right? And again, the standard deviation formula is on the AP. Think through what those things mean. Need three things from the mechanics section. The first thing you're going to find is the standard deviation. Then you're going to find the z score. Okay? 
if we have a Z score, if we're using a normal model, then based on our hypotheses, we can find a probability for this tail, or we can find a probability for this tail. Right? So the third piece is we're going to find a probability on Z and our alternative hypothesis, and it's called a p-value. I know, we have really fancy names in statistics. But that means we have three different p's in the section we have to be careful of. We have p-hat, we have p number, and now we have a p-value. These two are proportions in the problem. This, okay, keep that straight. This, I think, makes a lot more sense what the p-value is. I'm going to talk in a second, but it makes a lot more sense when we actually do a question in context. We actually calculate all these things. All right. In this, the probability using normal CDS. You want to know the area under that normal curve. Okay. So, for the ingots example, right, we had 400. I'm going to check all the conditions. All right. Sample size is big enough, independent, yada, yada. The normal sampling distribution model should work. And they find the standard deviation. The point. Then they a Z score. So that was their P hat. A negative score of negative 1.5. And if you remember, our alternative hypothesis in this case was that P is less than 0.2. Sorry, my pen is being a mess. All right, we thought it was less than 0.2. We thought there had been some sort of change. So if you look at a normal curve, all we did was we did a normal CDF. And we went from negative infinity to negative 1.5, and we got this probability, 0 0.067. Okay? That's going to be our p-value. Now, it's important we need to know what that p-value means. What do we do with that? The probability. What is that probability of? Okay? So bear with me here. A p-value. We want to know, are the data surprising given the null hypothesis? All right. We want to find the probability of seeing data like these, or something even less likely, given the null hypothesis is true. So this data like these, that's our sample, that's our p hat. All right. So once we have this probability, we can make a decision. Again, we call that probability the p value. So, when the p-value is high, we haven't seen anything unlikely or surprising at all. Okay? I mean, the p-value is the probability that we would get p-hat if the null hypothesis is true. So, their airplane example, p-value, which was point zero six seven. That means there's a 6.7% chance we would get a sample with a 17% cracking rate. Oh my goodness, my pen is out of control. If the null hypothesis is true, well, there's only a 6.7% chance of getting that sample 17% cracking rate. That's kind of surprising. That means it wouldn't happen very often that we would get that sample. All right? So it wouldn't happen. So in that case, our p-value is low. It's very unlikely we'd observe data like this if our null hypothesis were true. Okay? 
So then there's two different things that can happen. Your p-value can be high, your p-value can be low. If your p-value is high, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That means we're just saying, this is not surprising to me that we would get this sample of 17%, and so I don't think there has been any change. We fail to reject. You do not accept. Tonight, I'm going to give you a reading assignment from the textbook, and it compares a hypothesis test to a trial by jury. It puts it into some nice context for you to understand what's happening. Okay? Now, if the p-value is low, which in this case was my airplane example, 6.7%, that's pretty low, all right, then we reject the null hypothesis. Okay? Now, that does not mean that our new p is 0.17. We just think that there's enough evidence from this sample that this process has showed us there's been a change, all right? This p-value part is going to be the most confusing and the most complex, and it's going to take us a while to work on it. We're going to talk more about p-values tomorrow, but it's going to take us a little bit, okay? Moral of the story here until we get into some more with some context we're doing one all the way through. p-value is high. We fail to reject. P value is low, we reject. Notice it's always about the null hypothesis. Okay? It's not about the alternative. We don't accept anything. We either fail to reject, that means they're we're doing. The next H naught of a change. We'll put that into context. Okay? When we do an example, I'll try to get into that. We'll try to talk about that. Okay? So then we have a conclusion statement. All right? So the conclusion statement, you're going to have the part about how it's high or low and you fail to reject and you reject. All right? Then we have we have to make sure we've answered the question. So if they say that there's evidence of an increase and we have rejected the null hypothesis, then yes, there's evidence of an increase. And we would put that in the increase of whatever, whatever our context would be, okay? Um, it goes on to say your conclusion should never be the end of a... If you're in the real world and you were doing a statistical test, you wouldn't just stop and be done and make a conclusion. For example, with the airplane. They're 6.7%, their p-value. That would have proven, well, not proven, but that would have shown that there was evidence that this cracking rate had been decreased. That means they would run more tests. They would try again. I mean, they try to improve even more. All right, so you normally just don't stop and say that and you're done. Normally you're doing something actively and so you're going to continue on. All right, so here's our example today. We're going to go through this, all four steps. What I put on this screen today is what I expect to see on every single hypothesis test all of you all do. Again, I said this is pretty much the only thing in this chapter. So you shouldn't be surprised about what's going to be on the quiz. It's going to be a hypothesis test. And everything I write down is important. It is not a time to skip steps. It is especially not a time to start freestyling and making up things. Okay? So... Bear with me, we're going to get through all these steps. So the National Center for Education Statistics monitors many aspects of elementary and secondary education nationwide. Their 1996 numbers are often used as a baseline to assess changes. That's probably an important piece of information. In 1996, 34% of students had not been absent from school even once during the previous month. In the 2000 survey, responses from 8,302 students showed that this figure had slipped to 33%. Officials would, of course, be concerned if student attendance were declining. Then the question states, do these figures evidence of a change in student attendance? So, my first step is write hypotheses. I'm going to label the steps. You don't have to label them but I'm going to label them just to make sure we know what step we're on. Now, 
not, you have to have a parameter value here. That means you have to have a P. In future chapters, it won't always be a P. But we're talking about a specific statistic here, or a specific, sorry, a specific parameter. We're not just talking about some willy-nilly number. It is something, it is a portion. So the next hypothesis is that there has been no change. So in the question, it says the 1996 numbers were baseline. And so it tells us then that 34% of students had not been absent from school even once during the previous month in 1996. That's our baseline number. So if there was no change, our null hypothesis is P equals 0.34. For the alternative, I know it says in the question something about student attendance were declining, but the question asks, do these figures give evidence of a change in student attendance? It doesn't say is student attendance declining. It doesn't say is student attendance increasing. It says has there been a change? So we have three options, greater than, less than, or not equal to. If it said increasing or decreasing, we'd have greater than or less than. But it says a change. So we're going to put not equal to. I'm sorry that my pen can't let me write anything for two seconds. Please believe. Try one more time. Okay. So note that we still use 0.34. Our, both of our hypotheses, just like we talked about yesterday, are based on that, null high, that no change, that one proportion, okay? So our null is that the, there is no change, P still equals 0.34, and our alternative is that there has been a change, so P does not equal 0.34, okay? So we have done the first step. There's nothing else to that step. The next step I'm going to do down here. Okay, the next step is the condition. We'll see if I can get through this. This pen is dropping me nuts. All right, so we have two assumptions, just like before. We have independence assumption, and for that assumption, we talk about two things. We talk about randomness, okay? So in this question, does it say that the 8,302 students are random in any place at all? It does not. So we do not say the 8,302 students were random, because it doesn't say that. So what we do... We assume the 8,302 students are a good representation of the population. Okay, that's good for randomness. The independence assumption also includes the 10% condition. So, is 8,302 less than 10% of all students? Because this is just talking about students in general. I would hope so. All right. The other assumption is sample size. For sample size for proportions, we have success failure. So, we are going to use the 0 0.34 hypothesis for the success failure condition. And we're assuming the null hypothesis is true throughout this entire question. We're trying to get evidence that the alternative may or may not, there may or may not be changed. So, we're always using the null hypothesis because we're assuming that is what is actually true. So, we have 8,302 times 
4 greater than or equal to 10. And we have 8,302 times 0.66, what's left over the complement, greater than or equal to 10. We get 2,822.68 and 5,479.32. Then it would be nice if you said that failure condition has been met. Instead of writing Okay. Now, as part of the condition section, you have to have a sentence. You must end your conditions with a statement about what you're going to do. So, in this case, because the conditions are met, I can use a normal model for the sampling distribution for proportions and I can perform a one Proportion the so again, there's two critical components for this. You said the normal model, and you say what you're using, and you say what kind of test you're doing. All right, that is the second section. That's the conditions, the modeling section. All right, so now we're moving on to mechanics. Okay, so for the mechanics, again, there's three things we need to find. The standard deviation, so we can find a z-score, so we can find a p-value, all right? So for the standard deviation, again, we're talking about if the null hypothesis is true. So we're using 0.34 for p and 0.66 for q. We get a sample of size 8,302. You get, you get approximately 0 0.0052. Okay, there's our standard deviation. Did we find a z-score? We found z-scores in chapter 6. Of our parameter, so this is the one time we use p-hat. Right, so 0.33 minus 0.34 divided by 0 0.0052. And we get negative 1.923. So think about a normal model. Right, negative, this is zero, negative 1.923 is almost two standard deviations below the mean. Now look at our alternate hypothesis. It says no change, or sorry, there could be change on either side. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the lower probability, okay? Now, if our alternative hypothesis had been P is less than negative, or sorry, less than 0.34, we would be doing the same thing. We're finding the lower tail of the normal model, okay? So we're going to do that by doing normal CDF. And I would like for you to have some sort of notation to show what you're doing. So I'd like for you to show probability, that's what a p-value is, that z is less than, oh my goodness, sorry, my computer's going crazy. Z is less than negative 
that shows you what you're doing to an AP grade. It shows me what you're doing. So I would like for you to have that. But in your calculator, you're just doing normal CDS. Since we're doing this lower tail, we're doing negative infinity to negative 1.923. And we're using the mean of zero and standard deviation of one because we're using this normal model up here. Okay? So if we do that, RP equals 0 0.0272, right? So if our alternative had been that we, the attendance rate was declining, then this would be our p-value and we would be done. But it's not because our hypothesis is a little bit different. Our hypothesis was actually that p is not equal to 0.34. Not equal to means both tails. So I also need to know the probability of if the z-score was 1.9. Okay? So it should be the same. It's symmetric, normal symmetric. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this by 2. So our p-value is actually 0.0545. Okay? So normally you're finding the lower tail or the upper tail of the normal model. If it says not equal to, though, you're multiplying by 2 because it's both tails. Okay? Otherwise, you would just do one tail. You only multiply by 2 if it says not equal to. All right, so there's our p-value. So we have one more section. That's all the mechanics. You should have these things, though. You should have a standard deviation. You should have a z-score. A picture never hurts. A probability so that I know, because remember, this is not acceptable on the AP exam. Normal CDF means nothing. So show that you're finding a probability, that z is less than something. That's fine. Multiply by 2, because it says not equal to. We have a p-value. So now we're to the last section. I told you it's a lot. I'm sorry. And that's your conclusion. Okay? So the first thing you should have in your conclusion is the p-value and if it was high or low. 5% is pretty low. Again, tomorrow we'll talk about a way of deciding if it's high or low. Because for now it's going to be like, is this high, is this low, I don't know. But tomorrow we'll talk about how you can determine if something's high or low. Okay? For now, though, we'll just say 5 is pretty low. So we say with a p-value, of 0.0545, which is low. You don't have to say it exactly like this, but somehow how with a low p-value of 0.0545 or something, saying it's low, saying the p-value. Remember, if it's low, we are surprised to have gotten the sample result. So if we're surprised, and if it's low, we reject the null hypothesis. So I will reject the null hypothesis. Now here's what the p-value means. There is only a 5.5% chance that I would have seen a sample like this, where p hat was equal to 0.33, given the null hypothesis is true. Okay? 
Okay? Now, this part is really important. This part we're going to work on, because it's going to come up on the AP exam a lot, about what p-value means. And then what we need to have is something in context. We haven't actually answered the question. We say we're going to reject the null hypothesis, but what does that mean? So up here, way up here, all of this work, it says, do these figures give evidence of a change in student attendance? We rejected the null hypothesis. That means we think there's been a change. We don't know what kind of change. We just know there's been a change. So we can say something to the effect of, there is evidence, or you can say it seems that or something, that the student attendance rate has changed. Okay? So, four pieces. Hypotheses. Done. Conditions. Done. Statement about the conditions. What model to use, what test to use. Done. Mechanics. Done. Conclusion. P-value is low. We're going to reject the null hypothesis. We're rejecting the null hypothesis that there must have been a change. Context, student attendance. I know this is long, and I get that. I'm sorry. I apologize. But every hypothesis test is going to be similar. And that's pretty much what we're doing the rest of the year. All right? So I'm going to give you a chance to work on one in class, and we can talk about it. And then I'll give you one to do for homework, and we're going to keep talking about it. We're going to keep practicing. You can't get better this way, keep practicing. And I think the key piece of understanding this is the p-value, and we're going to be talking about that. Okay? I haven't forgotten that. We're going to get there. Thank you guys for being patient.